on the process side of things, you need to deal with all the information. This is where the real challenge comes into it. I mean, anybody can put a scanning engine in. That's, that's not really that hard work. Uh, it's what you do with it afterwards that, that kind of uh, generates the work for the organization. So the process that we do is we, we kind of go through, categorize, prioritize, and then bite size it. So the main reason for the bite size especially is because the information can be overwhelming. You need to break it down. So we'll go through each one of these and we'll just step through. So when we categorize things, what we do is we sort the vulnerabilities into different categories. The reason we do that, let me just bring up the categories in the first place, there we go. The reason we bring break them down into the different categories, like configuration issues or missing patches. If, for example, the majority of the issues that we identify are because of missing patches, we know, A, obviously you're missing patches, but we also know that maybe your patching process needs to have a little bit of a review because, well, you're not applying the patches in a timely manner, therefore there's a problem there. And that problem might be because the team is under-resourced, you just don't have the people to, to go and patch. Uh, it might be because you have a, a business group that says, don't touch my stuff. Um, yeah, that, that becomes very obvious when you look at these types of things. For the configuration issues, we, we often use it to kind of give us an idea of how well or, or not quite so well an organization maybe adheres to build standards. Now, when, when we do a vulnerability scan and most of the servers in the network, they look kind of the same as all the other servers, you know that they're probably using some sort of standardized build process. If you get an environment where server A um, looks vastly different from server B and server C, etc., configuration settings, maybe the, inter the network profile that they have, then you know that maybe server A was built by you know, John, uh, the server B was built by Kim, and server C was built by Pete. And they all have their own ideas about how a server should be built, so there's lots of differences. Of course, that makes it a lot harder for vulnerability management because it'll change the profile over and over again. So consistency and, and standardization is actually quite um, uh, helpful because it means you can detect uh, issues or changes in the environment much easier. The other categories we use is, is things like outdated software. I mean, that's a pretty common one. Yeah, um, We all have scans coming up with, you have Windows 2003 servers installed, or if you're really unlucky, Windows NT servers or you know, two Windows 2000 servers. Although I guess by now they might actually be becoming secure because nobody knows about them anymore. Um, yeah, the other categories that we deal with is things like false positives. The false positives that you need to deal with, uh, every scanner will have a certain way in which it will try and identify a, um, a particular issue. So if we go back to um, oh, it was early 2000s, Code Red, some of you will remember that one. Uh, with Code Red, most of the vulnerability scanners on the market, they would look at a particular product number within IIS at the time. And of course, a few years after Code Red was actually fixed and patched, the product number never changed again, and Microsoft actually discontinued updating that product number. So the scanner would come around, find that product number, say, hey, that's an old product number, therefore you must be vulnerable to code red. It would give you the information, and of course that would be incorrect because you were far beyond that particular release. The, the trickier, like the, the SSL and TLS ones, they can sometimes be a little bit misleading. But either way, you need to look at your false positives. If you have a lot of false positives, what does that show? Well, it shows you a little bit of a process issue again. It means that you need to, um, uh, you know, more carefully weed out the information for your particular environment because some of the maybe some of the checks aren't relevant for your environment or they are just not helpful at all. The other category I use is the don't care or low risk items. Every environment has these, and they'll be different for every organisation. Uh, for example, you know, there's a vulnerability says there's a time ICMP timestamp issue. Those of you that run vulnerability scans, you'll know this one. Uh, it is firmly in the, yes, we should probably fix it at some stage, but we don't really care at this particular moment. We've, we've got bigger fish to fry. So they're the low risk items, the, the I'll fix later items. So the categorization, like I said, 
it'll show you process issues and it'll show you common trends or things that are going to go wrong within the organization. The next thing we do is prioritize. Now, of course, in every environment, everything's urgent, everything's important. I, 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 I hear your pain, um, but realistically, it's not. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it's not everything's urgent, not everything's important. There are things that need to be fixed first. So you need to prioritize everything that's been identified in a, you know, um, in a sensible way. And what we do is we look at the importance of the assets. We look at the importance of the organization. So is this a system that if it's down or broken or broken into, that's going to be a game over? Or is it a, you know, I, I don't know, the telephony scheduling system um, to, to maybe, I don't know, get a call going to a particular person? That might not be that important to your organization. The risk to the assets, the risk of remediation, and the risk of not remediating. So a lot of organizations struggle with these two. The risk of remediating, this is the, the, oh, if we fix it, it might break something. Yep, that's true. Um, pretty much every major vendor, including Microsoft, has released patches and updates over the last few years that are going to break stuff. To be honest, that's what your test systems are for. And if you don't have a test system for your most critical application, then you need to find another way of either testing it or you need to build maybe some redundancy into it. So, yeah, this might be a good business case for you. Um, the risk of not remediating, of course, is there as well. So what happens if we do not apply this patch? Well, with um, MS1710, for example, the risk of not applying the patch is that you have a whole network share with encrypted files. That, that would be the risk of not remediating. Uh, the risk of remediation for that would be that you'd have to take systems down and maybe they haven't been patched for a long time, therefore they might not come back up. Sure, that's a consideration. So we look at all of these. The other one that we look at is the ease or the difficulty of remediation. Okay, And how we use that, I'll talk about when we talk about bite size. And the other one is the accuracy of the information. Vulnerability scanners will make assumptions and you have to be technical enough uh, to understand whether some of those assumptions for your environment are actually correct. So is the scanner actually accurate? Now a lot of the scanner tools that are out, uh, about on the market, they will actually allow you to do exclusions for certain assets, etc. So you don't have to necessarily disable a particular check. You can say for these particular types of servers, that check is okay if it comes back with a value of this, therefore I don't want to know about it. You'll still have a list of all your exclusions and your exemptions, but it won't show up in your report and make it all nasty and you have to explain why it's not important to be there. So here's some examples of uh, different things that pretty much should be familiar to most of you. The, uh, the These ones are ones that pop up quite uh, often. So SIFS account password never, never expires, you know, you, you, that one, it ranks as severe. Probably agree with that. That's, but, you know, if the password is 25 characters, then I probably don't care about it today. Okay, if you pass with six characters, then that one would worry me pretty much immediately. Uh, the SSL and TLS issues, well, we've had many of those over the last few years. Um, it's been ranked as a moderate, and again, I probably agree with that as well, mainly because a lot of those uh, SSL and TLS-based attacks are actually quite tricky to uh, do, and you, know, you kind of have to be lucky to get the right piece of information. But if we go down to um, the Diffie-Hellman group smaller than 1024, that's the second last one, that one's ranked as moderate. Now, if this was on internet-facing servers, then based on the importance of my assets, I'd probably say, yep, I probably need to go and fix that one. If it was on an internal server, I'd probably put it closer to the bottom of the list. And to be honest, if I'm fixing my TLS and SSL issues, the chances of me actually fixing that by fixing the other one is actually quite high. So this one will disappear off the list when I fix my more higher priorities issues. And now we get my favorite one, Windows Display Last uh, Username Enabled. Okay, so in other words, it shows the username when you do a control or delete on the machine. Now, some organizations, you would argue that that's probably a big deal. And most organizations, you kind of go, yeah, that's in the don't really care list right now. We'll fix that when junior is bored or when we, um, 
you know, when we get round to it. So the tools will give you one particular score. You need to understand how your environment fits together and whether that score is actually relevant to your organisation. And most tools, again, they'll allow you to um, change the scoring so you can make it a little bit more relevant for your organisation. Uh, but you just need to be aware of how you prioritise these ones so you can remediate it in a more appropriate. I like going for the uh, the, the issues that have a big impact to the organisation. Uh, I like going for the things that are easy to fix. The other thing that we do, uh, and that pops up with the categorise actually, I should have mentioned, is um, the number of different vulnerabilities within an organisation. So for example, if I have an organisation where I have, I don't know, uh, a million vulnerabilities, okay, but 900,000 of those are all the same vulnerability just across a lot of the assets, that's going to be a lot easier to fix than an organisation that has a million uh, vulnerabilities, but every thousand is a different vulnerability, so they've got a huge range of vulnerabilities to address. That's obviously going to be much more difficult than an organisation that only has one vulnerability to fix lots of times. If you um, kind of use Google as an example, uh, a friend of mine, he works there and asks them, how many servers do you look after? And he says one, and which was kind of a little bit staggering to me. One server, that seems like a lot of uh, resourcing for one server. He says, yes, but that server is replicated 50,000 times. So, but he literally fixes one issue on one machine and that just gets replicated across all the other machines because they are all exactly the same. So, so there's a lot of value in that standardization again that we talked about a little bit earlier. Which brings me to bite size. So you've run your scan and you've uh, printed out the, the report and as you can see here, uh, page one of 11,670. Now, just imagine when someone walks up to your desk and says, here's a list of issues. It's only 11,000 pages long. Um, <laughs> if you're still talking to that person after they've dropped that onto your desk, uh, well done. Uh, I would probably be maybe swearing quietly into my cup of tea or coffee at that particular time. So we need to break things down. When you drop a big bundle like this onto someone's desk saying, hey, here, go fix this, uh, it's not going to get done. It's like me cleaning my kitchen cupboards. You know, I know it needs to get done. Um, I look at it. It's a lot of work. I don't want to do it. I've got a big fun pile on the left, and I've got the I don't really want to do it pile on the right. And strangely enough, my fun pile just keeps growing and my have to do pile uh, you know, pretty much stays the same. So that's why I'm one of the reasons why a lot of the issues in organisations don't actually get fixed up is because it's just an overwhelming task. So what we do is we take it down to bite size. What we do in the bite size is we look at the priorities, we select what's achievable, and then we also look at the quick wins and the slow burns. And what I mean by the quick wins and the slow burns, that uh, Windows last name display, okay? I would put that into the quick win. Why? Because it was across a, a quite a number of servers and it is a simple group policy change that will affect all the systems, you know, and it takes five minutes to do and the risk to the organisation is nil. Uh, so that's something that could be done quite easily. A slow burn though, well, maybe that's actually patching or applying a particular patch to a whole swag of systems, especially your production or your critical production. That requires maybe a little bit more testing. It requires a lot more effort uh, in order to get it right. So once you've broken it down into the, uh, the smaller portions, then you kind of need to liaise and negotiate with the different teams to get it done. One of our customers is a few years ago. We literally had a report that was about 30,000 pages and it was quite a, uh, a concise report. It wasn't 30,000 pages, you know, with one vulnerability and then 100 pages of explanation. No, it was basically 30, 40 vulnerabilities per page times 30,000. So quite a, quite a significant number. And the organisation said, yep, we, we can fix those and they had a good go at it for about six months and they reduced everything down to about 29,000 pages. So some progress, but not a lot. 
So what we did there is we kind of broke it down into the priorities, the quick wins and the slow burns, and then we just created a big list of stuff that the security team wanted remediated right now and stuff that we could live with for a little while longer. And what we did is we went to the server team and, and had a little uh, change that was group policy. Let's just pretend it was the uh, last name display one. And we went to the server team and said to the server team saying, hey, we've got this security issue that we'd like to fix. Um, what do we need to do to get it done? And, and we basically volunteered say, we'll even write the change control for you. So you just tell us what you need done, we'll write the change control, we'll submit it, we'll get it through to CAD, and when do you think that can be done? And the guy looked at it and went, oh, I can actually do that now. That's a no impact, no, no change, if that helps you out, not a problem. And he literally did it there and then. Maybe not necessarily the right thing to do either, but you know, we got something fixed by just going up and asking for one thing. So we did that repeatedly with the server team, we did it with the desktop team, we did it with the, some of the devs as well, where we picked a vulnerability that we would really like to get fixed. We picked initially some of the high impact, easy to implement ones, and then as we progressed and went back to the different teams, we kind of started increasing them towards the slow burns. The end result, after about a a month or so initially of doing that, you know, slowly going to the server team, slowly going to the desktop team, we actually started seeing that they were coming to us, which was kind of heartwarming, really. Uh, when you see someone from the server team come up to you and say, hey, I've got a half an hour out of your list of things that need fixing. Have you got something that I can do in half an hour? And lo and behold, yes, we do, actually. This one here should take about 25 minutes. You know, with your skills, might even only take 10. So great. So after another three months or so, they've reduced their uh, their thirty thousand page report down to maybe about five six hundred page report. Still a ways to go, but you know much better than what they started with. So you know breaking things down into the small chunks. I can't emphasise it, it enough. Is something that you should definitely consider because people just look at this big pile of things that they need to do, and the fun things will always win out. So. At least I do in my pile. 